Okay, I'm going to start chapter three, looking at the westward movement, and uh, just kind of understand that this is just piggybacking off of everything that we've talked about, our reasons for colonizing America and the new government we have and the purposes that we have and always, always, always looking to expand and to get bigger and um, to to really control the continent. And you can see a lot of the same themes from chapter one, those reasons for expansion specifically um, as, as we move further. Um, and also, you know, the idea that we're going to move beyond the Appalachians um, kind of anger at the proclamation line of 1763 from the British. So um, let's get going. We're uh, looking at early expansion. Uh, last, uh, when we ended chapter two, we kind of got to Jefferson's administration. And here we're going to kind of take off further from Jefferson's administration. Um, but at that point, when he becomes president, what we're looking at is uh, we already have new states. Uh, from as early as uh, Washington's administration, Kentucky and Tennessee, and um, Ohio is going to join in 1803. And you can see here that the United States is growing. Um, we are uh, filling in this territory that we gained from the British when we won uh, the American Revolution. And this is the territory right here that we took uh, in the Treaty of Paris of 1783. We're already beginning to um, organize all of this up here. And remember, we talked about the Northwest Ordinance and the Land Ordinance of 1785 and 87. And, and there you have, this is the, the territory that's uh, going to be uh, developed during that time. But we still have some unorganized territory right here. And uh, there's the Mississippi Territory. Uh, so we're growing. Uh, you'll notice what we don't have is in gray. Um, at this point, we do not still control um, Florida, but that's going to come. And of course, Louisiana and um, all of this out here in the West. Now, officially, if you look here, our border is the Mississippi River. Uh, it's a long river. It's a great territory. Uh, it's a great boundary, rather, uh, to have. It's a very stationary let's call it a stationary even though it's moving against a river but it's there it's a physical landmark which is a lot of times what boundaries were um but as we saw with um the the appalachians when we were colonies uh, there's a lot out there that we want um, whether it's to explore whether it's to exploit we want it. And Americans have always pushed those limits. Um, the Mississippi River, of course, is important for trade. And um, these farmers back here um, are, are going to really rely on the Mississippi River to get their goods out, but also um, to get goods in. It's so much easier to use the Mississippi than to travel um, over land. Uh, the problem is this little town about right here, and that's going to be New Orleans. Um, the problem is it's kind of like a door. Uh, you can control a room, but if you can't control the entrance and the exit, what kind of real power do you have? So, um, New Orleans itself is um, controlled by Spain, okay? And now, they don't really own it. Uh, they, had, they had secretly traded this, um, the whole Louisiana Territory to France in 1800. Uh, so they don't really own it, but they do control it, okay? And, and that's fine as long as they are letting us use it. Um, but, of course, nothing ever um, is is as easy as that, is it? Uh, and of course, in 1802, since we brought it up, uh, Spain is going to close the port, port of New Orleans to American shipping. And again, if we look back, um, New Orleans is so important to the Mississippi River, to control of that river. And that is a major point of exit for our goods um, from the West. So um, in addition to closing the port of New Orleans. We also have Napoleon Bonaparte, who is, you know, uh, the little madman from France. Uh, he is an emperor at this point, and he wants to control the world. Uh, he, he is willing to start in Europe, 
and he does a good job in trying to take it. Um, but he actually wants to expand outside of Europe also. And he wants to expand his empire in North America. And New Orleans is vital to that. This is going to be the port of in, the point of entry for all of those troops. Now, I'm going to back up here for a second. Um, this belongs to France. Okay, here is New Orleans. And you have Haiti out here. Um, also, um, which is controlled and owned by France at this point. Now, the question is, do we want French troops occupying this territory on our border? Knowing that Napoleon wants to control the world, maybe not. Um, maybe not. So um, the the importance to us and why this was so concerning, not just to uh, you know, to Americans in general, but of course to the government and Jefferson, who's president, uh, France is threatening the sovereignty and the economic stability of the United States. Economic stability because of their ability to close the port of New Orleans. Um, and of course our sovereignty because, you know, big, massive army possibly um, occupying uh, the territory to our west. So this is concerning to us. So Jefferson's going to send uh, Robert Livingston and James Monroe uh, to meet with the French minister Talleyrand, and they're going to discuss buying the territory of New Orleans. Now, James Monroe is a secretary of state, and um, Jefferson, remember, had been secretary of state under Washington. I'm going to point this out because this is going to get um, into that jumping off point, what we consider, you know, if you want to be president, what do you need to do next? And it's not important for right here, but I'll be talking about it in a little while when I get to um, Andrew Jackson. Um, but, but, but Jefferson is interested in buying uh, just... New Orleans. That's all he wants is New Orleans. He wants the city so he can control, he, so the United States can control um, the Mississippi River. All right. Uh, and then a big surprise happens. Oop, you know? Oh, uh, and, and sometimes surprises are good. Sometimes they're not. Um, but going on at about the same time, there's a slave revolt in Haiti. And, um, they're going to win. The slaves are going to win. They are going to overthrow their French overlords, however you want to put that. Um, but they're going to fr force the French out. And so France has lost a major foothold in uh, the Western Hemisphere. And so they begin to lose interest in the Americas at this point. Um, they're also at war with England. Uh, we can go back, Pat, you know, even before the French and Indian War. Um, the British and the French have been at war uh, for a long time, on and off uh, at this point. But um, a lot of people are at war with uh, <laughs> Napoleon. So uh, France, is, France has got a lot going on, um, and, and, and it's expensive stuff, particularly this war with England. And they need money you know, war being expensive and all that. And so Talleyrand is going to make um, Livingston and Monroe an amazing offer. And they're going to offer to sell them the entire Louisiana territory for $15 million. What? And that comes out to pennies per acre. It was an, it was an amazing deal. It was a great deal. And in October of 1803, the Louisiana Purchase extends our borders to from, of the United States to the Rocky Mountains. Now, um, was it constitutional? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, Jefferson didn't know either. Jefferson really struggled over this. Uh, remember, Jefferson is a Democratic Republican and that they have a... Uh, strict, they strictly interpret the Constitution, and there is nothing in the Constitution that mentions the United States government buying territory from other countries. So, can we or can't we? Um, I, I guess in some ways, um, it's, it's probably lucky that it, it, it goes beyond just the president, and that we have um, checks and balances and 
a divided power. So anyway, we end up with Louisiana, which is an amazing buy for us. And if you look at how it extends our territory, uh, look at that. Uh, we do get that that wonderful little piece of, of land right there, uh, Louisiana, I mean, um, uh, the Port of New Orleans. But look at all of that wonderful territory. And of course, uh, Jefferson is going to send Lewis and Clark to um, to explore this territory. What's in it? Who's in it? Um, the the plants and the animals that live here, and they're going to have some amazing observations and books. I mean, uh, drawings and things that they're going to put into their journals and and later publish. Um, but this was some great, and of course, um, Sacagawea leading the way. Um, but we have some troubles going on, even though we are expanding. And expansion is wonderful. Um, as you can imagine, this is going to be good for us economically. One, we can sell the territory, sell the land to um, everyone. Like we had seen over here in, in the Northwest Territory, uh, splitting it into those townships. So we have the ability to sell the land to raise uh, revenue if needed. Um, but, but also there's land here to exploit. Um, think about all of the possibilities for... Uh, minerals, growth, uh, farming, those kind of things. So uh, there's a lot of potential out here. Um, unfortunately, we, we have other troubles. Um, we talked in chapter one about um, Britain and France again, you know, uh, still going at it uh, by chapter three. But we talked about the XYZ affair and the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, well, this is kind of related to that. Um, throughout that conflict between Britain and France, um, we had remained neutral, um, but each side is making it hard for us to to stay neutral. Um, the United States always has this freedom of the seas kind of thing, and that's great and wonderful. Um, the, the problem with freedom of the seas is that do other countries are are other countries going to abide by that and recognize it and do we have the ability to to enforce that freedom of the season and, and believe it or not at times we we do but here um, we want to continue trading with both france and england the problem is is that when we trade with france what we trade them can be used against Britain in the war, and they want to stop that. And vice versa, when we trade with Britain, uh, what what we what we trade with them can be used against France. So both sides are going to stop American merchant ships, um, and they're going to impress our sailors. Now, listen, I don't mean they're standing there posing and talking about how great and wonderful they are, but they're going to press our soldiers, our sailors rather, into their navies. Um, this was more done by the British than the French, but they did do it. Um, basically, this is kidnapping, you know. Um, Jefferson <laughs> decides to punish both countries by stopping all trade with them. Um, I, was this punishment to them? No. No, it wasn't. Uh, it really hurt us, though. Um, and he did this with the Embargo Act of 1807, and it ends all international trade between the U.S. and the rest of the world. So it just cuts us off. Um, we are getting no imports. Now, the, the problem with no, getting no imports is that we are not very industrialized at this point, and, and we do still have a reliance on industrialized goods coming from Europe. But but at the same time, if if there are no imports, understand there's no exports, and that is going to be devastating to northern shipping interests. Okay, France and Brit France and Britain, though, yeah, you know, they just trade with other countries. There's plenty of other countries out there for them to trade with, so it's not as big of a deal for them as it is for us. And it was a disaster for our merchants, and it did nothing to help Thomas Jefferson um, politically either. Uh, luckily for him, we're getting to the end of his administration, so um, no biggie. Uh, interesting thing about um, the embargo, and, and I actually think I have this backward, um, but usually the embargo is they use a turtle uh, to... Um, kind of personify this 
embargo and you can look at a lot of things with the turtle and everything but it's just interesting if you see a turtle they're talking about this embargo and here you can see it as a snapping and stopping and here you can see it as stopping um, but uh, it's just an interesting point um, in the election of 1808 James Madison there he is former Secretary of State is going to win but he is also a Democratic Republican so uh, the Democrats remain in power Uh, we have some problems on our western border. Um, the Native Americans in the Northwest and in Louisiana territories are determined to hold on to their land. And in some ways, this makes sense. Um, they see the Americans as a threat. They see them, I mean, they're just kind of steamrolling over the territory and just gobbling it up, um, you know, um, at least to their eyes. And they're determined to hold on to their traditional, their ancestral lands. Um, they're led by Tecumseh, uh, and they he was supported by Great Britain. Now, this is going to put uh, us in conflict with Great Britain also, okay? So, so we have Great Britain, now remember they're up in Canada, we have Great Britain supporting the Native Americans in their fight against the United States. So so again, we still see some conflict with Britain here, um, even though they're, they're kind of doing this by proxy. Uh, William Henry Harrison, for future president of the United States at the time, is the governor of the Indiana Territory. And he's going to send a warning to Tecumseh, and he's going to tell him, you know, we've got past agreements. We have had um, some agreements that, that you need to abide by. And if not, hmm will take care of you. Um, so Tucumseh is going to go south because he's trying to bring other um, nations, other Indian nations, other Indian tribes into this alliance, specifically here, the Creek Nation. And while Tucumseh is away, um, Harrison is going to attack the Shawnee uh, near the Tippecanoe River in 1811. Um, Tecumseh at this point is going to cross into Canada and he's going to join the British troops. And again, this kind of looks bad. Um, it, it makes the British, it makes it look like the British is, you know, sowing some discontent. And they were. Um, but this is going to kind of lead Americans to begin to call for war um, against Britain again. Now, can we do it? Do we need to fight Britain? Um I don't know if we need to fight Britain again. Um, could they defeat us? Probably. Um, they're still stronger than we are, even though we beat them once. Um, but but this, this is an odd war. Uh, but anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, you've got these war hawks. Um, and, and, and we do tend to, even today, call people who support war hawks and those who support peace doves. But um, these war hawks begin to call for war with Britain um, again, and there's three reasons here um, that we need to know. One, the impressment of our sailors. You, you know, you're, you're stopping our ships and taking our cargo, but you're taking our sailors. Um, there's also this, again, land. We want Canada. We just want Canada. Um, r land is money. Land is power. Uh, and, and so Canada, there's a lot of it. And um, they do have a lot of natural resources, timber, things like that. So um, it, it would be an acquisition that, that would make us wealthier. Um, also, you see, and they're blaming the British for inciting Native American unrest on the frontier. And there's a lot of truth to that. So for the first time ever, oh, Congress is going to declare war against Britain on June 18th, 1812. And we are off to war. Um, now, I've got a lot of this. I, and I, this is in your notes, guides. Um, I'm not really going to read this, but I'm just going to kind of go through and, and just give you a little bit of what's going on here. I don't want to go um, too in-depth here because you don't really need to know um, all about the war, more of the consequences and things like that, okay? Um, so we want to invade Canada because, you know, we want Canada, so we need to take it because they're just not going to give it to us. Um, but uh, the British and the natives are gonna, Native Americans are going to seize Detroit. Um, Britain controls Lake Erie, um, which is in between us and them. 
Uh, so Commodore Perry is ordered to seize Lake Erie. Now, I love this about um, Commodore Perry. And of course, he becomes a massive National American <laughs> hero. Um, his ship is going to be destroyed. The British are going to destroy his ship and then the British are going to surrender to him. Um, I don't know how that works. I don't know how he did it. Um, it's a great thing to look up if you're interested in, in, uh, in finding that out. But this is going to pave the way for us to invade Canada. Um, and like I said, Perry is a huge national hero because of this. Um, here's William Henry Harrison again. Uh, he's going to uh, defeat the British at the Battle of the Thames. Um, and Tecumseh is going to be killed here. Um, Andrew Jackson, another future president, is going to defeat the Creek Nation at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. And they're going to give up uh, even more land with the Treaty of Fort Jackson. Um, the American troops are going to defeat, be defeated at the Battle of Bladensburg. And this is going to allow the British to sail into Chesapeake Bay. Now, here's where things become interesting um, because this slide right here is kind of just again you have it um, but this is there's just a lot of interesting things going on here because the Chesapeake Bay is is going to lead them into the Washington DC area and they're going to invade Washington DC and they're going to burn the Capitol um, building and the White House um, and uh, one of the great stories that comes out of this is the First Lady Dolly Madison um, as the White House is burning, um, most people will tell you if your house is on fire, get out. Um, but but this is the White House, and so the house is burning down, and, and she's running to get the portrait of George Washington. And she's carrying a portrait and, and trying to save stuff um, as, as the house burns down around her. Uh, she did save it, and she was okay. She did not die in this. Uh, the British are going to continue up the Chesapeake Bay, um, up the Chesapeake rather, into Baltimore. Um, and they want to capture Fort McHenry. Um, there's a battle here in September. Um, but the British eventually are going to surrender here because the Americans refuse to surrender. Do you, do you see what I'm saying there? The Americans didn't beat them. The Americans just refused to give up. Um, and, and the British just kind of say, well, well whatever. <laughs> I guess we'll go home. Um, this is also the battle um, in which Francis Scott Key wrote um, the Star Spangled Banner. Um, he was there and he saw it all through the night. The British are bombarding the Americans and they're just getting pounded. And when he woke up the next day, he looked out and there's the flag. It's still there. It's still, it's still flying. Um, it does not become our actual national anthem until 1931, um, I believe it is. But, but it, was, it was written uh, in, in 1814 by Francis Scott Key, who witnessed this particular battle. Um, and again, Americans refused to surrender uh, at the Battle of Lake Champlain, and so the British retreated. Y'all listen, why did we... Because we do win this war. We do win the Battle of uh, the War of 1812. Um, and, and it really comes down to, if you look at a lot of this going on here, uh, and, and even getting back to Commodore Perry, we, we really win because the British aren't trying overly hard. Again, they're, they've got other issues. They've, they've got that war with France, and their attention is divided. And that's all well and good. But... They're, they're not really putting a lot into it. And you can look at it like, is this worth our time or is it more worth our time to defeat France? And of course, um, they're going to choose France. But um, last battle of the war, oddly enough, comes after the war is over. And that is the Battle of New Orleans. And Andrew Jackson is going to defeat the British there. Um, but like I said, uh, it's, it occurs after the war officially ends. Now, I will say this, the, afore, the war officially ends on January, excuse me, um, December 24th of 1814. They don't have email, internet, or cell phones, so it takes a little bit longer for us to figure that out. Um, but let's look at the end of this war, the Treaty of Ghent. Um, it does not resolve any border or trade disputes between the U.S. and Britain. It does nothing for that. But 
it does increase our patriotism because we won. Um, it basically just returned things to the status quo, uh, to the way things had been before. Uh, why this is important is because, by gosh, we held our own twice against Britain. Britain is the premier world power, and we're this little upstart. <laughs> We've defeated them not once, but twice. Um, and so this is called... Uh, by many people, America's second war for independence. Um, it does cement our independence. We were in no danger of losing our independence here, but it just kind of sets it in there that, oh, we did earn it. We we did, uh, we do deserve it. Um, remember that embargo? Well, um, and, and then of course, moving into the war. Well, because we can't buy European and then particularly British goods, um, our manufacturing is going to take off. Um, we need to we need to make it ourselves. And so our manufacturers in the north, because this is where our manufacturing is located, it, they're going to begin to profit and they're going to begin to grow. And so we see, um, you know, the north already had trade and commerce and now they're going to move that into uh, manufacturing and they're going to become very wealthy um, during this time. Um, finally, it leads to the demise of the Federalist Party uh, for the simple reason that they were the doves. They did not want to go to war with Britain, but, but let's also tell the rest of the story here. Um, they were meeting from December 15th. I want you to notice the date that, that we signed the treaty. <laughs> from December 15th to January 5th, they are opposing the war at the Hartford Convention. And they're, we won the war, but they're still protesting. Uh, and again, same thing. They don't necessarily know we've won, but um, so, you know, they're a little embarrassed. Oops, <laughs> I guess we made a mistake. And what we begin to see is the waning of um, the Federalist Party over the next few years. Um, so uh, anyway, that is um, just kind of the first part, uh, you know, gaining some of this land and trying to gain more. We, we, we ended up buying Louisiana tried to win uh, Canada, but it does not work. Um, tomorrow, we will, our next lecture, we will look at um, the Industrial Revolution. So I'll meet you back here later. Bye-bye.